Little Britches. Father and I were ranchers. Chapter 24. I become a cowpoke. The flood washed out the dam at the head of our irrigation ditch and tore away most of the gates and locks. Father and all the other ranchers along the ditch had to work for a couple of weeks to fix up the damage. And then there came pretty near being another battle, and everybody had to go to court to find out how much of the cost they had to pay. We drove Prince to school for a couple of weeks at the beginning of April. That was after my ribs got well enough so I could go back to school, and Father was using Lady for plowing. After that, we had to walk because Cousin Phil came out and got Prince. The gold panic ended about that time. Fred Altland started hauling hay again, and Mother sold five pounds of butter for cash. Mr. Wellborn sent a man out from Denver to take care of his trees, and I hadn't been able to make a penny all spring, and I didn't know what I was going to do after school let out May 1st. I almost wished I were going to herd Mrs. Corcoran's cows again. It would be June before Fred's hay was ready to cut, and there wouldn't be much to do at home except to weed Mother's garden. And besides, I was lost without Fanny. I was talking about it one noon at school, and somebody must have told Mr. Cooper. Anyway, he came over to our house that evening and said he'd heard I was hunting for work that summer. Father told him I was always hunting for work anywhere except in Mother's garden, but he thought I'd find enough mischief to get into right at home. Mr. Cooper lived five miles from our place, over west of Littleton, and nearer the mountains. They got their irrigation water from Platte Canyon and didn't have any ditch fights, so they always had good crops. He was one of the biggest ranches anywhere around and always hired a dozen or so men in the summer. Before we went home, he told us he would pay me $20 a month and give me steady work from May 1st till the end of September. Then he said we didn't have to answer for a couple of days, and he'd drop back to see us again. I wanted to go to work for Mr. Cooper worse than I'd ever wanted anything. I pestered father and mother a lot about it. At first, father said I couldn't go because Fred Altland had given me work for the past two years and depended on me to ride his stacker horse. Grace could ride a stacker horse just as well as I could and she didn't think it was fair that I got all the money-making jobs while she had to stay home and help Mother. I went to see Fred on my way home from school the next night and talked to him about it. He said he'd give me $20 a month himself if the last year hadn't been so tough, but I wanted to take Mr. Cooper's job. Grace could write old Jeff. Maybe that had something to do with Father and Mother letting me go. First, Mother made Mr. Cooper promise to let me come home every Saturday night and father made him say I could sleep in the house instead of out in the bunkhouse with the men. Mr. Cooper came for me the Sunday night after school closed. Before we got to his place, I knew I was going to like working for him as well as I liked working for Fred Altland, but I didn't begin to realize how much I was going to like it. The first one I saw when we drove into his place was my old cowboy friend, High. He knew me right away. He was standing out by the corral fence with some other cowboys when we drove in, and he yelled, Hi there, little britches. How many toes you broke so far this spring? Mr. Cooper told me hi was his cattle foreman and was a great booster of mine. Then he said for me not to let hi spoil me, but I didn't know what he meant. After Mr. Cooper had taken me to the house and his wife had shown me where my room was, I went back out to the corral. There were seven or eight other cowboys there with hi and they were talking about bringing cattle down from the mountains for sorting and branding. When High saw I had come back, he picked me up and set me on the top rail of the corral. Then he wanted me to tell the other fellows about going to two dogs and getting caught in the cloudburst. I didn't want to talk about killing Fanny in the flood, and I guess High saw I was getting a little choked up, so he asked me where I'd put my saddle and blanket. Of course, I'd never had a saddle or blanket, but I didn't like to say so, and said I liked to ride bareback better. All the fellows but High laughed when I said that, and one of them hollered, By God, High, that'll earn you not to waste a week's time saddle-making. 
I looked kind of funny for about a minute, and I guess I looked funnier. Then he started to laugh, too. Damn you little britches, he said. You're going to ride that old saddle I made you, or I'll hang it around your skinny neck. He reached up and hauled me off the rail and carried me to the bunkhouse under his arm, the way he'd carry a little pig. Before Father had said I'd had to sleep in the house, Hi had fixed me a bunk right next to his. He had the quilt spread over my saddle, bridle, and blanket. They were the prettiest ones I ever saw, and I had to bite my tongue to keep from squealing. It was a breaking saddle like Willie Altavolti's, only a lot better. The pommel was wide and thick, and it flared out a little before it drew into the horn, so a fellow could lock his legs in under. The horn was only high enough to get a rope around and had a nice rake forward. The knob must have been covered half an inch thick with leather. There were wide skirts to the stirrup straps, double horsehair cinches, and a rawhide latigo thongs front and back. The blanket was a Navajo, brown with bright green zigzag stripes, and the bridle was silver-mounted with a curb roll bit. I couldn't believe that High was giving them to me, that they were really my own. It was pitch dark before High got through showing me my saddle and making me understand that it was mine to keep. Then Mr. Cooper came out to the bunkhouse and told me it was time for me to come in and turn in. He said the boys would do me enough damage when we were out working stock, and he was going to see that I got my sleep when I was at the home place. We ate breakfast in the cook shack, and the cook was Mexican who could hardly speak a dozen words of English. But he could make good biscuits and flapjacks, and he put lots of onions and peppers in his fried potatoes. I ate so much that it nearly came out of my ears. At breakfast, Mr. Cooper told me that when we were working with the cattle, Juan, the Mexican cook, would be my boss most of the time, because I'd be the water boy, but he'd do the bossing when we were at the home place. Then he said I could loaf around that day and get acquainted while the men were getting ready for the branding. When we were through eating, we all started out to the corrals. On the way, High said the first thing I ought to do was pick my horse. I don't think Mr. Cooper liked to have him say it, because he said, Didn't you hear me tell Little Britches I'd do the bossing around the home place? I think his pa and ma had sooner he'd ride Topsy or Eva. Topsy and Eva were the little seal brown ponies Mr. Cooper had driven over to get me. First, I put my saddle on Topsy and let me ride her. Then he put it on Eva. They were both nice, gentle little horses, but they didn't have the get up and get to them that Fanny used to have. Maybe it was my new saddle. Maybe it was because I'd been used to Fanny, but I didn't like either of them. High's blue roan was in the big pole corral with a couple of dozen other horses, and there was another blue in there that looked almost like him. He was a young horse, wide in the chest and narrow in the withers, the way I liked him. He had a fine black head and sturdy legs with cat hams. I couldn't keep my eyes off of him. All morning, the men kept busy roping horses out of the big corral, saddling them, and riding them in the breaking corral. Most always, they got the horse they were after after the first throw of their rope. But there wasn't one of them, not even high, who could flip a rope like two dog. Some of the horses busted wide open when they got a rider on them, but most of them only crow hopped around for a few seconds before they quieted down. High said there was only two or three of them that hadn't been ridden in the last spring but they had gone a little wild during the winter. I watched and watched, but nobody put a rope on the blue. I guess Mr. Cooper and High knew I was watching him and knew I didn't like Topsy and Eva too well. While we were eating dinner, High said, For God's sake, Len, why don't you give the kid a shot at him? I seen him ride his old man's seal brown down back of the schoolhouse, and with a little learning, he'll stick like a louse. Mr. Cooper didn't even answer, but kept right on eating till somebody else down the table called out, Aw, for God's sake, Len, give the kid a break. Then Mr. Cooper looked up like he was mad and said, Look here, you damn fools. Who's responsible for this kid, you or me? I promised his ma I wouldn't let nothing happen to him, and I ain't going to let him fork no green colt. Hi looked as surprised as could be and said, Hell, Len. You ain't been hearing so good. 
It's a blue coat we're aiming to see him straddle, not a green one. That time, all the men laughed except Mr. Cooper. He pounded on the table and hollered, I don't give a damn if he's blue or green or yellow. You ain't going to put little britches on no wild cayuse while I'm around to give the orders. <laughs> and we'll pause here and try and finish this chapter next time. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks so much for watching. Love you guys. Bye-bye.